So let's talk a little bit about this year. So just on this landing site, I've got my name, I've got my website in case you want to go look at any of that stuff. I totally get that. Um, so this has been sort of the image I've been going back to again and again this year. Um, this is just an idea of a dumpster fire of a year. The reason why I want to start here, even though we're on the tail end of it, the pandemic is not yet over and we're still going to be feeling the effects of it for a very, very, very long time. And I I worry a little bit sometimes about um, what could be called the toxic positivity of we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, this year we, we did it. We're the teachers are heroes. They are heroes, but heroes can also feel like it was a very, very hard year. Like it doesn't preclude you from being a hero or having done um, amazing things and also feel like it was a nightmare of a year. So I just want to anchor ourselves in the reality of it's been a really hard year for a lot of us, for our kids, for our families, for ourselves, for um, pretty much every human being on the planet. NPR called it the pandemic a mass traumatic event. And we're going to be feeling the effects of that trauma for a very long time. And so are the kiddos. Um, kiddos who weren't even born yet will still have the effects of um, trauma long past when we think of the pandemic as a reason. I think that's one of the things that's in, that as a teacher, our memories have to be long in some ways. I taught in New York City after September 11th um, and years after September 11th, we still felt the echoes of how that experience impacted kids who were babies at the time, right? Or, um, you know, who may not have like a memory of the event, but had impacted their families, their homes, their lives in various ways. And so in no way, shape or form, when I talk about potential, do I want to be minimizing um, how difficult this year was? I more wanna exist in what I'm gonna call a yes and space. Yes, this year was hard. And also this year had potential. Yes, there was so much trauma and also there was hope, right? So it's never an or, it's always an and. And in a given day, in a given hour, different ones of those emotions are stronger, right? So, you know, 20 in 20 minutes, I might be feeling the impact of the trauma. And in 30 minutes, I may be feeling the impact of the possibility. And so just naming that for yourself, you don't, this is, this is a bonus piece of advice. You don't have to feel great all the time, even though the pandemic seems to be getting better, it's not like it's not like everything that happened up to this point turns off. And I think remembering that and being gentle with yourself around that, that there's recovery time because A, no one had any time to recover up till this point, right? It was go, 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 survival, 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 survival. The first free day you have, you're gonna be like, ah, oh, ah, oh, right? And so, um, as we talk about this, I just want to just continually say and honor and respect that this year was hard. This year was a dumpster fire. And no matter how you split it, no matter, no matter the positive things that happened, it's also true that that's true. So with that, um, let's dive in. So I've been thinking a lot about um, the pandemic generally, right? And one of the things that felt really hard for us as teachers was this reactive position we were all we were all in. And it feels like some of us might still be in in this uncertainty into what next year will look like. And so you're always like, there's there, you, you feel like I can't make plans, right? Like, how am I gonna make a plan? How can I, I can't prepare anything, right? I just am constantly like, ah, right? And I know just from my, you'd be like, okay, I think we're getting back in. Oh, we're not getting back in. I think we're gonna be six feet. Oh, we're three feet. Oh, we're not gonna, oh, what? Right, like it just felt like you were constantly reacting, reacting, reacting. I think another way to think about this is that um, instead of being um, constantly passive in it, we choose to be responsive to it, right? That's a little bit of like a vocabulary switch in that like we weren't just passively letting things happen to us, but we can choose to be responsive and say, whatever comes, we can handle it, right? But beyond that, um, I think one of the hardest parts of the pandemic was the moving target aspect of it. And so what I want to invite you to think about is that there are always um, always moving targets in education, right? So we can't think about teaching for just this year. We have to think about teaching um, 
in a broader scope into what our goals are for shifting education in a more, um, in a broader, bigger context that we don't just make decisions for what's gonna work this year, but we make decisions that slowly day after day after day after day, create the change that we need for young children, that we need for our schools, that we need for our communities. And so I would invite you in this, in this time together to start thinking about what are the, what are the bigger goals you have for teaching, right? Like take this space to just let set your brain free a little bit and say, if I had a magic wand and I could um, set an aspiration, an outcome for schools 10 years from now, what would it be? And then we'll start to talk about the ways we can begin to shift that, right? With our behavior day after day after day. So the first big, huge question that we're gonna start with, which if you haven't had all your coffee yet, is gonna maybe feel a little too big, but you know, if we don't seize some of these, um, these moments to create change, then people are making the changes without us. And so what I would invite you to first do, right, is to think about what you, um, want for schools for young children? Like what do you dream and do you hope for? Because only when we've got that target are we able to shift our behaviors bit by bit to get there. And if we don't have dreams for schools and for kids, then other people's dreams are gonna dictate our behavior, or dictate our curriculum, dictate our experiences, right? And so um, I'd invite you in this space you may not be the superintendent, but that doesn't mean you can't have a dream for the future of schooling. And it doesn't mean that your dream for the future of schooling doesn't create real impact. And so if this question feels a little hard, I've got a few that have been on my mind, right? Um, you're welcome to drop it into the chat. You're also welcome just to privately process this. But when you dream towards what's next, like when you dream towards what, what we're gonna accomplish in a year, in five years, in 10 years, what are the things that you that you have front and center in your mind, right? So is it that this year has really has really presented to you an opportunity to move towards a more equitable, just school experience, or has anti-racism become um, something that you're instead of just saying I'm not gonna uh, instead of saying I'm not racist, saying I'm anti-racist, and how does that exist in my space, in my language, in my methods? Is it that you've realized during this year that the best laid plans are subject to a thousand and one interruptions? And so rather than try and plan for everything, I'm going to be comfortable being responsive. Is it that um, the stronger home and community connections we've built really mattered this year? And so how do we keep that going? Was it around this, this year felt like there was a little more empathy and compassion how do we keep growing and building that? Is it about innovation? Is it about resilience? Just thinking, we are all headed somewhere, but some of us haven't authored that destiny yet, right? We just go to school and do our work without considering where we're headed. I wanna invite you to take a really active stance that no matter what the year, no matter what happens, you continually to take step forwards in these directions or whatever directions that you're choosing, right? Um, these are aspirations or could be considered outcomes that we have. The way we build ourselves towards aspirations and outcomes is not just having them, but by shifting our behaviors every day in this direction. In some way, these serve as a North Star, as a destination, as a constant reflection, which we may not know how our day, um, we may not, we may, how do we measure our day? Do we measure it in the way that we were equitable and we were anti-racist in the way we were responsive or do we measure it in, um, how high our data was, right? So, and those things may not feel mutually exclusive to you. And so that's may not be the greatest example, but when we reflect on how our day was, we need something that we hold um, in front of us, a mirror, a lens, right? And so, so considering the mirror and lens you wanna bring with you from this day forward, right? Um, or have been bringing with you, I think is a critical part of our work as educators. So in these times when things get hard, it's really easy to get lost in. Yeah, but they said, I highly encourage you. Listen, a lot of what I'm gonna say today, you might feel like they're pushing 
against um, they. They said this, they won't let me, they. Whenever you feel that they, I strongly encourage you to actually figure out who, right? Because they is like the educational boogeyman. They is like the Baba Duck, right? Like who is they? Um, they is sometimes just like ancestral knowledge. A teacher told a teacher, told a teacher that one time and blah, blah, blah. And so, oh, they would never let us do that. If they has, if you can figure out who they is and they has a name, then, then um, that person can be addressed and we can provide things to change their mind. But if we can't figure out how they is, then they is just a ghost and you can't fight a ghost, right? So how do we stay focused on the potential um, that our schools hold, right? And their raw material. The first is by dismissing the idea of they. So anytime you feel that, well, they try to figure out the name, right? Who's the they I'm actually thinking about? And then I'm gonna invite you to, to think about this. Um, so what's interesting um, about the human mind is that we constantly hold stories that we tell ourselves. And the stories we tell ourselves both describe the past, what actually happened, but also shape our future actions. We have narratives that inform us of who we are, but they also dictate who we might be. To change the future, sometimes we need to rewrite the narratives that have defined us, right? Sometimes we look back and we say, oh, you know, I sometimes think about the 30 Rock where Tina Fey has this narrative about how everyone picked on her. And she goes to her class reunion and um, everybody's like, no, you were the bully. And she has this moment where she has to rewrite her narrative of like, maybe it wasn't that way, right? Um, and it's all very funny and I'm not telling it in a very funny way. But the point of it is um, when something happens to us in life, we interpret it not how it objectively was, but as we are, right? And sometimes our interpretations are not always accurate. We might say people picked on us or I never, I don't have any power, right? And taking a time to think about those, could it be, could it also be, what if, right? That can help us shape um, our behavior in different ways in the future. And anything that happens from this moment forward, we can think about how would I tell this story in a way, not that's delusional, but helps me remember my advocacy and self-agency in any situation I'm in. One of the, um, I, it's, there's lots of research around this. It's not just like a Tony Robbins feel good idea. Tell yourself stories to be the person you wanna be. There's actually a lot of research that supports this um, neurological research and um, social, social science research around this. But the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves and about our families and about our students are really important. And so one of the things that we, we may not always realize we have a choice about is, is we have a choice about the stories we wanna tell. Think about the Mr. Rogers saying, look for the helpers, right? He could have said, look at all the excellent of excellent that's going on. But the narrative and the story he's constantly trying to tell people is look for the helpers. So we have a choice to make right now in the narratives that we're gonna be telling ourselves and our communities. One narrative is like, we're gonna go back to the way it was. It's gonna go back to exactly how it was, or we'll be able to build something better, right? Is there a way in which um, the narrative we're going to tell is things will never go back to the way they were because the way they were, we didn't figure everything out. And we can tell that by kids' experiences in our classrooms, right? By families' experiences in our schools, by our own experiences. There's a few other narratives I wanna dig into with a little more specificity. The narratives that are in our control, how we talk about things, right? Um, when we think about the stories that shape our classrooms and the images of our child, I'm gonna talk about a handful. You might have more um, that you're thinking about and you're welcome to put your thoughts and comments in the chat as we go. So one of the narratives that I'd like to invite us to rethink right, to take a moment to pause and say, why, why do we say this? Um, and to reshape is about the role of pre-K and kindergarten, right? And so one of the things I wanna say to every pre-K teacher here, you are not a sous chef for kindergarten. It is not your job to prepare children for the next grade. And one of the things I wanna say to every kindergarten teacher here is you are not a sous chef 
for first grade. It is not your job to prepare kids for first grade. What I wanna to say to any first grade teachers here, you are not a sous chef for second grade. It is not your job to prepare kids for the next year. I am so tired of this dialogue of, we gotta get kids ready for the next year. We gotta get kids ready. We gotta get kids ready. We gotta get kids ready. Your job is not to be in a constant state of what do the next people need? Our job is to look at the kids in front of us and say, this is a unique, one of a time, time in children's lives. What are the things that specifically we can do to embrace and enrich and leverage this developmental stage? They will be first graders when they, will, when they are first graders, not a moment before. They will be kindergartners when they are kindergartners not a moment before. They will be eighth graders when they are eighth graders and not a moment before. We don't wanna feel this um, urgency and agency that it's on us to somehow prepare as though we are servants to the great above. We are not, we are teachers and we, to and we some of us chose and some of us um, um, found ourselves in these positions through a series of circumstances, but if we're here, the role of kindergarten is for kids to be in kindergarten. The role of pre-K is for kids to be in pre-K, right? And it's not anything but that. If you are in a district or in a school or in an experience where you are constantly hearing from the grade above, you need to get your kids ready. They need to know X, Y, and Z. This is something that we wanna shift. It's not that first grade tells you, all the kids coming to us should know their short vowels. No. Our job is to tell first grade, here are the kids that are coming to you. Here are their unique interests. Here are their strengths. Here are the continued things we're working on, right? But it's not how kids work. You can't like deliver a kid with X, Y, and Z to the next grade. And nor would we want to. You're not filling orders, You're not a short order cook, right? We are teachers. And so rethinking the narrative in our own minds What's the role of kindergarten? What's the role of pre-K, right? Um, and what's the way we help communicate that to our, to our colleagues? And I taught in a school where it was, we would do cross-curricular conversations and first grade would always meet with us and say, we'd like them to know all our short values. And as a team, we really, vowels, and we, we would bond together to say like, that's very interesting. That's not how it's going to be, right? And so part of this isn't, you don't necessarily go this alone, but even first in our minds, if you feel that pressure, they need to be ready for first grade. They're ready for first grade when they're in first grade, right? Like it's not, there's nothing you can do that 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 changes that. Okay, so now what other narratives? And um, thank you, um, Miriam, for putting in the one about learning loss and resilience, right? I'm gonna give you a quick semantics change that I learned from um, a colleague, Kara Pranikoff. She calls it not learning loss, unexpected learning. I love that because there was a lot of things that were learned that were not in the um, explicit curriculum. And I know it was frustrating when some of your little munchkins figured out how to annotate on your face, but oh my gosh, what an amazing skill set they acquired when they did that, right? Okay, so what's another, what's another um, so one that I think we're going to have to talk about in a big way, right, is this idea um, kids come in so low, right? These kids come in so low. Um, this is a narrative that we need to shift, right? This is one of the, um, I think one of the issues with schools is um, especially with the screener, the screeners, screeners look for very specific things, which may or may not be the things valued in the experiences kids have at home, but that doesn't mean kids don't have valuable experiences and unique experiences, right? I think a lot of a story, um, a friend of mine tells about her mother who would not think, who does not see herself as traditionally very, um, intellectual, but she knows the name of every plant. She understands when, um, how rain impacts flowering and seasons and how to bring a plant back from the dead. She was once on a walk with her mother and they heard a crazy noise and her mom said, oh, that chicken just laid an egg, right? That is something you would never find on a screener but is such a form of intelligence that we need in the world, right? And so just because, especially if we have some screeners that don't really catch 
everything, right? Or if we have a preset of values of what kids need to learn to be in school, we're going to miss the fact that kids have magical information that we um, never knew we needed in our lives. For example, every character in the Super Mario Galaxy, right? Or um, an encyclopedic knowledge of the vacuum cleaners um, pro specs, right? I had a kindergartner who had that knowledge for some reason, right? So rather when we, and this goes with Miriam, um, um, comment around um, uh, learning loss, this idea of kids coming in so low, um, that's a pushback that kids don't come in low. Um, kids come in with lots of different experiences. Schools need to get better at understanding them all, right? No child comes to us without years of experience in something right? You can't be alive on this planet for three, four or five years without years of experience in something, right? So how do we let, how do we admire and appreciate and leverage those things? Okay, so now the kids can't, right? So this, um, this idea that I'd like to do this, but the kids just can't. Oh, I, um, I, I'd like to have all those materials, but the kids can't, the kids don't know how to handle them, right? So one of the narratives we want to shift, right, work very hard, very deeply to shift, is that the problem is never with kids, right? The problem is with our curriculum, our methods, our environment, in making sure we've built a space where kids can thrive. There is a, a, a saying from a Buddhist monk that goes something along the lines of, when you plant lettuce and the lettuce isn't growing well, you don't blame the lettuce, right? If there was one ideology or one short um, shortcut we could, or a short phrase that we could adopt, adopt, right? That we just say to everyone, it's don't blame the lettuce, right? We don't blame the lettuce. If anyone here has tried to garden and I'm trying to garden, um, I have eight tomato plants, seven are thriving and one is struggling. I'm not like this, tom this tomato plant just can't grow. I don't say this tomato plant, no one's supporting this tomato plant, right? What I say is maybe this plant needs more sun. Maybe it needs more water. Maybe I didn't fertilize this one as much as I did the others. I think about the actions in the environment surrounding that tomato plant. When we catch ourselves saying kids can't, what we want to reframe to is thinking about what in our environment or our curriculum or in our methods might we need to change or shift so that we aren't seeing the same sorts of struggles again and again, right? And so this, um, <laughs> um, by the way, Miriam, I'm shouting out, kids actually do work masks better than adults. Um, one of the things that we do want to um, constantly come back to is this idea of all kids can when we play around with all the factors surrounding it, right? So it's not a kid's can't, it's, oh, this is what I was gonna say. There's a saying called goodness of fit. And a long time ago, goodness of fit was how well does this school program fit the child? But over time, it's been sort of shifted into um, how well does this child fit into the school program? The thing we should be adapting is the environment, not necessarily the child. Okay, um, a huge one that we want to explore in both our semantics and our action is that when we talk about how play is for when work is done. Oh, we're not playing, we're working, right? Or you can play when you got your work done or now is not the time to play, we need to do work. What I want to invite us to think about, and we're gonna talk about quite a bit over the next couple hours is the fact that play is in fact work. Just because the kids are enjoying themselves does not mean it's not work. And so, from our vocabulary to our schedules to the way we perceive the idea of play. This is one of those shifts that that might be more substantial than we think. For example, um, do we use words like, do we say things like you can play when your work is done or we're not playing yet, right? Are there some ways that we can start to catch and rethink that? How do we actually come to believe that play is in fact work? Um, if you're not quite, if you, sometimes we are, um, intellectually on board with this but then once we get into our classrooms we freak out a little bit and we're like no no no, we have to do all this work right so so understanding this is all a continuum there's a lot of narratives i intellectually believe but i don't behaviorally believe by which i mean i think to myself yep 
But then in the classroom, when I look at my actions, I think, oh, geez, right? Like I, I'm, I've got some ways to go. Okay. Um, this goes back to that idea of they won't let us. There are lots of things in the world that we think they won't let us do. Um, and I'm going to invite you to shift the narrative of passive to active, which is that you do have power and responsibility when you see something that is unfair, unjust, um, unequitable, that is harmful for children in little ways and in big ways, that it is not, you are not alone in this, that you have power, you have colleagues, you have possibility to advocate and to shift those practices. And especially um, when we take on the role of caring for young children, um, if part of that is we want to make the world and schools better for them, right? That's why we're in the position not to push the status quo, but to help kids um, and help schools become the next thing that's that's more supportive, a better environment, a better place for each and every single child who enters our space. All right. And so I'm going to pass it off to Beyonce here because um, she's got um, she's got the way to say it better, which is that throughout this pandemic, it was so easy to feel powerless. It was so easy to feel to feel as though everything was out of our control. But as we shift and as we move into the next phase, I just I want you to remember throughout the course of this workshop and beyond that you have an incredible amount of power. And every day you spend with a kid is a kid um, is an opportunity you have to use that power. So to hold on to that throughout this conversation and through and through this summer and into next year. Um, and I'm gonna um, talk about one thing very quickly um, before I give you a chance to talk, but uh, we're gonna be going into breakouts in a few minutes. Um, and in it, I want you, as we move into that, just be thinking about what we were just talking about those narratives that um, sometimes impair our own ability to change or school's abilities to change, to understand that you have the power to shift narratives. And um, just the next thing I wanna say to you um, is that when they look at what has the greatest impact on kids in classrooms, um, and they is John Hattie um, who studies studies. So basically what he does is he looks at every single study and then ranks them what had the biggest impact on kids, there are two that tend to come out on the top of the list every year. This is 2018. So 20, um, in 2018, the two things that had the biggest impact on student achievement, right, um, had nothing to do with curriculum, right? They had to do with teacher narratives. The first one is high estimates of student achievement. If I believe kids can accomplish great things, they do in fact accomplish great things, every kid. Um, Zaretta Hammond, who are culturally responsive teaching in the brain, talks a bit about um, different teaching styles. And there's a teaching style called the sentimentalist. And I see myself in the sentimentalist. Um, uh, and it's something I, I work really hard on now. And the sentiment, sentimentalist has lots of warm, fuzzy feelings for kids. But sometimes those warm, fuzzy feelings for kids are barriers to high estimates of their achievement. This is a space that I've occupied and I can still fall into and have to resist, even with my own child sometimes. I'll think to myself, oh, the poor thing, he can't do it, let me do it for him. That is a barrier to me seeing all that he can do, right? A high estimate of student achievement means that we occupy what Zaretta Hammond calls the warm demander domain. We have lots of warm, fuzzy feelings for our kids and also really high expectations for all they can do. Um, her phrase is, is we earn the right for high expectations because we put in the time to come to understand and know and love each and every one of our kids. And at the same time, we know that no one benefits from not believe, being believed in that they can do things. And in early childhood, high expectations are things like, I believe you can zip your own coat. I believe you can get your own materials. I believe you can, um, you can solve this problem with your friend. I believe you can share those materials. I believe you can join our community, right? It's not like, I believe you can read War and Peace, um, but I believe you can be an active problem solver in this world. Um, and the second one 
And I'll just say that again, Zaretta Hammond, warm demander. I find a lot of us in early childhood um, have that sentimentalist in us because there's such, um, such a, um, an, a strong overlap in caregiving and early childhood instruction, right? But um, warm demanding, that's the, that's the space you wanna occupy. The second is collective teacher efficacy. Collective teacher efficacy, um, Collective teacher efficacy believes that, or finds that teachers and schools that believe they can impact kids, impact kids. And they do so because they track, they track what's happening, not track the kids, but they watch and study. We tried this. Did this child have more success joining our community? No, we better change something else about what we're doing, right? We tried this. Is this child having more success with the alphabet? Nope let's change what we're doing again. Not let's get frustrated at the kid, right? Let's blame the lettuce, but what can we change in the environment? These two things together, right? Have the highest impact on student achievement of all the things that you could think of. So name anything, curriculum, home support, um, uh, class size, name all of those, right? These two come out as the absolute top. Um, what I would say to you is just as you're looking at this, um, for a while there, I do this sort of like partial understanding of being like, okay, these two are the top, that's great. But those numbers right there, um, the numbers of um, 1.39 and 1.44, uh, what that actually means is an effect size of one um, means uh, kids have a year's worth more of growth when classrooms and schools have these things. So classrooms where we have high estimates of student achievement and schools where we have collective teacher efficacy, kids are showing a year's more growth than schools and classrooms without those things. And you literally have to buy nothing except a mindset. I believe kids can achieve and I will do everything in my power to, to play with the variables until they do. All right, with that, <clears throat> I want to give one more person smarter than me, wiser than me, um, which is how do we get those mindsets? It's not that you convince someone else that they should believe kids can learn. It's by working on ourselves, right? And so everything we work through in this, um, in this uh, workshop and beyond, it's not about someone else making the change for you. It's about us, me, you, whoever else is here, right? Saying, I am going to do this. I believe I can do this, I can do this, right? Because um, <clears throat> that's what kids need in the world. So before we get into um, the actual sort of nuts and bolts work of play, I wanna give you a little chance to just talk some of this stuff out um, with some colleagues. So what are some of the barriers that you find around having around um, early childhood? What are some of the narratives you'd like to change in your community? So for example, I know one of the narratives I'm often seeking to change is that um, uh, the more academic a classroom, the better kids are prepared, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I push back against that narrative or another narrative I encounter sometimes is, um, uh, you know, play is chaos. Kids aren't doing anything worthwhile, right? And so how am I seeking to change that? So this is just an opportunity for you to um, introduce yourself, say hi, um, you'll see these people again. And also just to say one of the challenges or one of the narratives or one of the things, and if your school is great and perfect and no one's ever had a narrative, um, then what I would say is the narrative you're working on is continued improvement, right? We're continuing to, we're still trying to figure out how to get better. <laughs> Welcome back everyone. Thanks for um, your willingness to take some time to reflect as we are um, moving into our next little section, I do want to invite if you have any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the chat. If you want to say here's some of the things we thought about, feel free to say those in the chat. Um, if you have any general comments, say those in the chat too. Um, some uh, just a shout out to Miriam who's been using that chat, which we appreciate. I appreciate too because it helps me feel a little bit less like I'm just hanging out by myself. Um, Okay, I have a four-year-old stalking me right now. So my eyes to the side are just like keeping constant track of where my coffee is. Okay, so um, any questions or thoughts before we get into some, some more um, stuff? So let me put that more eloquently, good stuff. <laughs> um, okay, let's, um, let's jump in here uh, to some more big, thoughts.
I just want to say for the record, um, I find this particular slide very aesthetically pleasing. I feel like I chose a really good um, thickness on both the font, the speech bubble, and the color. Um, I just, sometimes you just have to have a moment to say, that's a pretty good slide. Okay, so um, let's talk a bit about what I'm going to call our North Stars. So, right, as a teacher, you've got to be pointed somewhere. So I think about the idea of North Stars being like, if I ever need to find North, I look that way, right? As a teacher, I've always found mentors both in my space and outside of it that I can be like, what are they doing, right? And so I want to share with you some of the North Stars that I've been continually coming back to. Um, but again, you can also have North Stars in your in your school, in your community, people that you um, that you're constantly moving towards and saying, "Okay, this is the thing I'm always working towards." Thank you for sharing that. Um, the uh, it might be ideas, it might be people, it might be um, it might be research, right? What what do you what do you constantly look towards? So when I think about um, one of the things we're moving towards, or hopefully constantly constantly progressing towards more inclusive and equitable classrooms. Um, when I think about who I'm uh, studying, exactly right, um, it could also be our students as well. Who am I studying for more information around this? The book that I've been going back to again and again and again is Deborah Wren Etta Sullivan's book, Cultivating the Genius of Black Children. So this book is written with an early childhood lens in mind. So um, she's written about what does it mean to really have a classroom that uh, doesn't just support, but cultivates the genius in her words of our black children. Um, and as Dr. Goldie Mohammed has said in her book, um, Cultivating Genius, that when we center the experiences of our black children, we raise the experiences of all children. So what are some of the tenets that I found um, that, that are in that book that I go back to again and again? Um, you can see through the handy, handy art of color coding, they have something in common and it's the word sharing, right? So um, in Deborah and Etta Sullivan's book, she talks about how sharing um, the space, sharing power, sharing the room, sharing the daily routines is one way in which we um, really support our black indigenous and children of color because we are no longer dominating the space but creating space for each child to, to, um, to flourish. One of the things that she writes about that I um, have thought about again and again and again and again um, since I read it and as I watch my little munchkin sort of do things in the background um, is this last build around sharing classroom management. She has some really incredible things to say about it, but one of the things she says is we have to stop weaponizing children's names. Um, she's really adamant that one of the things that we should not do is use kids' names as a corrective. So, um, instead of saying Samantha, right? We wanna preserve kids' identities. We don't want them to come to dread the sound of their name. And how, so how do we respect and value and cherish each child right down to um, you know, their actual name that was chosen so lovingly and so importantly for each child? Um, you know, the same with going through, um, making sure that we're saying each child's correctly, name correctly, um, never turning it into a corrective or a weapon um, in how we say it. So I highly recommend going to read this book. Um, I found it to be a pretty, pretty um, joyful and engaging read. It's not too dense at all. Um, and I felt like there were really practical things I could walk away with. All right, so the next um, person, Zoretta Hammond, um, who wrote Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. Um, it's another North Star I've been looking to and how I make my classroom more equitable um, and, and more inclusive and more culturally responsive. I just pulled out her culturally responsive brain rules to give you a sampling of some of the things that she's saying. So um, a, few, um, a few bits um, that I'll summarize as you read these a little more thoroughly is that number one, social relationships are critical for learning. You can't learn when you don't feel, when you feel unsafe. That is so true, right? Um, in a thousand ways, um, 
that we can think about, but think about all the other, they're both explicit ways we feel unsafe and implicit ways we feel unsafe. So connecting this to Deborah and Alice Sullivan's book, if a child, if the space isn't shared with a child, I don't see myself and my family represented, I'm going to feel unsafe invisibility is a form of feeling unsafe, right? So um, if the classroom is built in a way that isn't supportive of my body type or my, my physicality, I won't feel safe, right? So um, how do we help kids? How do we build those positive relationships which build the feelings of safety, which allows for learning? Um, I'm not even gonna attempt to um, explain all the incredible thinking she has around how culture guides how we process information. This is, if this is an interesting thought to you, go read her book, Zoretta Hammond, Culturally Responsive, um, um, Culturally Responsive Teaching. Um, but reading it really made me rethink some of the assumptions I had about instruction. Um, the, the ideas in the, in the rest of them have to do with how kids best learn. And through it, um, sort of the highlights are learning is dynamic. It's like not passive. I don't sit and learn. I do and learn um, that the, when things are coupled with what's the phrase funds of knowledge, but that idea of when we say kids come in so low, we're often not honoring their existing funds of knowledge. Um, what we're saying is that once we find out what kids know a lot about, all new information attached to that is going to be much more impactful. And that um, learning happens through challenge and stretch. That means focused on problem solving and relevant to kids. Okay, um, so now let's think a little bit about um, another, some other places to look when we think about the importance of building kids infrastructure, um, their intellectual and social infrastructure. This is the way I've been referring to um, what people sometimes call soft skills. Sharing is an infrastructure skill. Problem solving is an infrastructure skill. Um, uh, executive function is an infrastructure skill. I find infrastructure to be a better way to describe it than, let's, than the word soft skills because infrastructure really underscores that this is what everything else exists within, right? I need to have this infrastructure in order to do just about anything in life. So um, let's talk about some of the, the research or things I look to and I encourage you to look to around mm -hmm. infrastructure. So one thing, and I actually share this information with families when I do my, you know, meet the teacher, back to school night, whatever you call it. Um, uh, this comes from a study uh, that took a look at um, kindergartners, uh, kids entering kindergarten. So it looked at kids entering kindergarten, followed them for 19 years, and then reported on the findings. And what they found is that social skills are a better predictor of long-term success than academic skills. That is to say, kids who entered kindergarten, um, uh, knowing how to share, outperform kids who enter knowing their letters and sounds. The second thing the study found, and it followed these kids for 19 years, is that social skills can be taught. Social competency, social infrastructure can be taught. And so one of the things that was found is that um, if things, if kids have just a single point increase in their social competency, um, that leads to huge gains in what we would call traditional academic outcomes. Um, I appreciate that you're all early childhood teachers while this is happening. Okay, so things like, um, uh, being more likely to get a high school diploma, being twice as likely to get a college degree, and 46% more likely to have a stable full-time job at age 25. All of those, um, all of those things, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> a little bit of a focus issue in this moment. Um, <laughs> all of those things come from an increase in social skills. I share this with families early on. Um, I share this family early on, early on because I want them to know that when we're focusing on kids' social competency, social infrastructure, um, that we're also going to be helping them do all these traditional academic things as well, right? So when we work on sharing and problem solving, when we work on, um, you know, expressing our feelings, all of those, um, all of those are. Uh, going to lead to all the things we say we want, right? So this year has been interesting because I've heard so many families, you know, um, as I'm, they're like, oh, this school does the common core. Like everybody does the common core more or less. 
how you do it is the difference. Do we do it in a way um, that, um, that helps kids also build their social infrastructure? Are we doing it in a way that diminishes it? So if you take a look at um, uh, this, the, the actual study, you can see what they define as social competencies. Upworthy has a very friendly article. The Upworthy article is called Researchers Studied Kindergarten Nurse for 19 Years, and this is what they found. I, um, in my Meet the Teacher, I would always make this um, article available to families. Um, so uh, they could just read it. It's really friendly. It's got like GIFs in it. Um, but essentially it makes the point, which is like, it's not an either or, it's an and. And it helps us understand how things like working well with others is going to lead to more success later, how being a self-starter leads to more success later, right? Um, so the Upworthy article is, um, is a really great one to share with families. The study itself, which is at the bottom here, the study itself is just if you wanna look and see what the actual protocols were, you can find the social competency scale at the, um, at the, at the, at the study, but you know, um, I've seen that you you use a, the, the kids first, the kids assessment, the DRDP, um, uh, that, has many of those built into the habits of mind that you're studying. So it's not, it's it's very much aligned with um, some of what you're already looking at. Okay, so um, let's talk about executive function, right? Because that's like, that's a fun word that everybody likes to throw around. Um, so when I talk about executive function, I'm primarily using the information from um, Harvard Center on the Developing Child. If you've never been on the Harvard Center for the Developing Child, it's a very helpful website. It's a lot of information, um, connects research with um, some theory, some practice, right? Um, and all of it free and online. Everything I'm sharing with you is coming from the, um, uh, from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. So, we often talk about executive functioning. Um, we often, um, and often, if you if you come from a special ed background, there's often a lot of talk about supporting kids' executive function, but we don't always define it. So I would just want to spend a little time talking about it. Uh, perhaps the most important thing, though, is this quote, um, which I often share with families as well. Uh, I'm doing the number one um, thing you're not supposed to do, which is to put a lot of text on a screen and then read it, but I'm about to do that to you right now, um, just because I think it's so important. And basically what this says is, contrary to popular belief, young children who do not stay on task, lose control of their emotions, or are easily distracted, are not bad kids who are being intentionally uncooperative or belligerent. Young children with compromised or delayed executive function skills can display very challenging behaviors for which they are often blamed. In most circumstances, however, it is the protracted development of the prefrontal cortex that is to blame. What does that mean? Essentially, the same way you wouldn't yell at a child who's not yet walking, walk already! Um, kids developing their, their executive function, right, are not going to have, the, it's, it often looks like quote unquote bad behavior, but really it's just delayed executive function development. One of the things that I find really um, helpful in the in some of the writing around executive function from Harvard is this idea that we're all born with the capacity to develop it, but it's learned. It's not a given. You have, everyone has the capacity, but you have to learn. The other thing I found really interesting and sort of helpful to think about right now is that um, the the number one thing that delays executive function is trauma. Every single child in the entire world has undergone trauma this year. There's been economic insecurity, financial insecure, instability and insecurity. There's been um, tension in households. There's been tension in schools. There's been every single child is going to be coming to us um, having had some form of trauma. One way we might expect to see that show up is that some behaviors that we would not typically expect to see, we might in fact see, right? So we might see kids who are having a little bit of a harder time staying focused or kids who, um, who get distracted or who maybe lose control of their feelings. Rather than see that as an inconvenience, we just see that as part of our curriculum. 
feelings are part of early childhood curriculum. Actually, feelings are part of every curriculum, right? It's not an inconvenience, it's instruction, right? Um, and so uh, for us, what this requires, sometimes I think in early childhood, early childhood space, you should have like a screaming room for the adults, right? Because like to continually output calm, patient, and caring sometimes requires you to deposit your other emotions elsewhere. Um, so uh, you might have to take care of your own self in some more um, ambitious ways because we are going to need to be the best versions of ourselves, right? Of being our calm and caring and, and, and understanding selves, even though we also have undergone trauma. So um, feel free to take my advice and set up a screaming room or whatever it is that you need. Some people, some people, you know, you know, just need to breathe in some, you know, lavender and they're good to go. I need to drop a few expletives like at lunch every day and then I'm good again, right? So, all right, let's talk about specifically what executive function is though. Um, so there's three, uh, there's three big ones um, and they are working memory. So that's the ability to hold information in your mind and use it. So when, okay, sorry, we need a little kiss. Okay, so, um, Working memory is the ability to hold information in your mind and use it. When I'm explaining this to families, I often say this, sometimes you think your child's not listening, but it's really their working memory, right? So my best analogy for this is going to a restaurant back in the glory days of restaurants. Um, uh, yes, exactly, Miriam. This is, a, this is going back to better seizing this whole child moment. Okay, so um, working, so when you go to a restaurant, think about the specials for a second, right? So sometimes you go to a restaurant and they just orally give you the specials. And I don't know what it is about Italian food, but I don't have a very good sense of what is meat and what is cheese sometimes. So they'll be going through the specials and they'll say something like mortadella and I'll be like, mortadella and I'm like trying to run through my inventory to be like, do I think that's a meat or do I think that's a cheese, right? And then all of a sudden all the specials are done and they're like any questions and I'm like everything from the word mortadella on is a question, right? I don't, I don't even know when one meal ended and one beginning. That is not because I'm not an intelligent, um, capable human being. It's because my working memory was overtaxed, right? Now contrast that to a moment where um, they bring a board out and the specials are written on the board and they're basically explaining what that board says to you. Now I'm having a little bit of an easier time, but I still might have a few issues. Again, I still don't know what Mortadella is, right? Contrast that to the third scenario where they actually bring the plates out to you. So they make those like fake plates and they're like, here are our specials today. And then they show them to you and they point to things. And I see, ah, now I know what Mortadella is. I can see it, right? Here's the thing. You can, just because working memory gets taxed doesn't mean I'm not capable. It just means I might need a few more supports to be capable. So when you say to your child, right, um, okay, like, you know, your child at home, we're going to leave in five minutes. You need to pick everything up, get it away. You need to meet me at the door with your shoes on and don't forget your backpack. And then and the next thing you do is you see your child playing with blocks in their room. It's not that they weren't listening necessarily, possibly, but maybe also that all that, the vocabulary before we, after, right, I might have lost them in that. Or... I gave them three things and they only got the first one. Go into your room. Hey, there's blocks in my room, right? Same thing in the classroom. The child who appears to be not listening may have just lost you in the working memory, right? They're capable, they're intellectual, they, they wanna be part of the community, but we put them in a situation that um, it doesn't sustain, doesn't, doesn't give them an opportunity to demonstrate that because we've given them 67 directions with no visuals and um, using words like before that and, 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 and don't forget to, right? In which they might still trying to be like before that, right? Like, so in those moments, right? We wanna think about most of the time, how can I support the child's executive function in this moment? The same way photographs, arrows that move, right? Um, checking back, giving smaller increments of things. That's changing the environment, not changing the child. This child doesn't listen. No, you just tried to give them a restaurant menu with absolutely no words or pictures to help them navigate through it. Okay, the second executive function is inhibitory control. So inhibitory control is my ability to resist doing what I want to do what I need. 
Now, this to me has been the number one thing impacted by the um, by um, uh, pandemic because I know that I should not eat 15 brownies in a sitting. However, this pandemic, I have found it literally impossible to not eat 15 brownies in a sitting. It's not that I'm not capable, it's that stress has diminished my inhibitory control. We set up beautiful classrooms with inviting materials and interesting things and beautiful spaces. And then we tell kids, don't touch anything yet. What a recipe for disaster. Building a classroom that is beautiful and encourages exploration, we should then encourage exploration, right? Um, I think a lot about soft transitions versus hard transitions. I think we have too many hard transitions in our classrooms. Stop this, now start this. Stop this, now start this. Soft transitions are when you're ready, move on to the next thing. When you're ready, move on to the next thing, right? Um, I was really challenged by an inclusion specialist when I was um, a special ed teacher working in the inclusion setting. She came to give some feedback and, and I had this one child who would never clean up when it was time to clean up. So what I had done is moved her cleanup time earlier and earlier and earlier. And we were still having the same problems. She said to me, why? Why does she have to clean up? Let her keep going until she feels done. And this like Puritan in me was like, but we're all cleaning up and everybody's got to clean up because we're all in a society. And she was like, that's not actually how society works, right? Like you don't need that to be a hard transition. Let her clean up after everyone else has cleaned up and she sees what they're doing. Don't try to, every time you're like, now you have to clean up earlier and earlier and earlier. It's even harder. Have everyone clean up, start their next thing. And when she's ready, she's going to join you. And then you'll work on that over time, right? This idea that um, perhaps we work with where a child's inhibitory um, control is as opposed to trying to fight it. You know, um, I have a few things to say about transitions. Um, one is that in elementary school classrooms, transitions are like their own subject. It's like 30 minutes of transitioning. First, I'm gonna sing, come to the rug, come to the rug, come to the rug. And then as kids start to come to the rug and I'm counting, I see four friends on the rug. I see six friends on the rug. I see three friends on the rug, I see, right? Like in all this effort to get kids on the rug, it's like a 45 minute ordeal. Rather than trying to make transitions, um, so expansive, just make the next thing the transition. Your rooms are not that big. I've been in elementary, uh, uh, in early childhood classrooms across the globe. If you start to read a lot on the rug, the kid at the drinking fountain can still hear it, right? That sometimes we don't need to say, everybody needs to get on the rug before I start. Sometimes we start and kids come to the rug. This is how it works in the real world. They're not like the band is gonna start when everyone's sitting in their seats. The band is gonna start when, I see 22 people sitting in the seats. I see 24 people sitting in the seats, right? The world, the band starts, right? Um, you hear the music and you come on over, right? Um, thinking about how the world works a little bit more and saying like, maybe I don't need to have this weird draconian rule where you all have to be sitting silently before anything interesting begins, right? Like that's saying, let's do the most boring thing before anything else. The second thing that um, this inclusion specialist pushed me on, and I'm so grateful she did, was my feelings around cleanup, right? So everybody has to clean up their own stuff. That was my, everybody has to clean up their own stuff. Everybody has to clean up their own stuff. She really pushed me on, is that, is that actually how the world works? Does everybody, is everybody do the same type of cleanup? Is everyone driving all of their stuff to the dump? No, people have different jobs. In a community, it's not that everyone does the same thing. In a community, everybody contributes to the community. You might have some kids who love to organize the block area, let them do it. And other kids might help the community by setting the timer to say, we're gonna try to clean in five minutes. And another kid might help the community by leaving their stuff where it is and going to deliver the lunch bags to back to the, back to the, the, to the lunchroom because the chaos of cleanup is too much. Right, this idea of, um, this is me saying all these things is like push, is the idea of pushing back against some of these notions about what it means to be a member of a community, a member of a collective, a member of a space, right? It doesn't always have to be the exact same for everyone, right? And so 
this 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 big thing inhibitory control master thoughts and impulses so as to resist temptations right um that's going to be a learned skill but if kids don't have it yet we can help them out by making changes in our environment the first thing kids do in the morning is whatever they want provided it's safe then i don't have then i don't have to worry about kids taxing their inhibitory control right um because we've built the schedule in a way that's supportive of them the last one is cognitive flexibility. That's the ability to change and adjust to, cha um, to changes in task demands and perspective. Different adults might request different things of me. I had a kiddo, it took him a really long time to keep his shoes on in the classroom because at home he had learned you always take your shoes off before you go inside, right? That's a very small sample of cognitive flexibility. Um, the same for kids who like sing really loudly in the bathroom or take their pants off before they go in, right? That's like a cognitive flexibility thing. They haven't quite figured out um, exactly what the rules in school might look like. This is also kids who sit in one spot every day and the idea of sitting in another spot is really kind of jarring for them. They're just working on their cognitive flexibility, the ability to change. Now, the thing that I say to families when we look across the three of these, oops, which I don't have a slide with all three of them, but that's okay. Um, when we look across all three of these is that you need these to do algebra. You need these to do um, complex um, literary essays, right? So um, uh, Miriam, I don't have a slide with all three on it, but if you go to the Center on Developing Child, you'll actually find a more beautiful article about it. Um, uh, I will add one for the future. Um, you need these three things it doesn't matter how you do it doesn't matter if you develop them through play they're going to help you for the rest of your life right and i think that sometimes you don't have to develop these things through like like rigid like i'm going to force you to work on your working memory types of way once you've got them you've got them right and so um they help you no matter what no matter how you gain them and play is one of the main ways we do that okay so now let's talk about developmentally appropriate practice um exactly samantha um the the um correlation between why do we have some of these rigid ideas and how is that connected to white supremacy culture there's um there's some great writing around that um Samantha, if you have a link to that to drop in that would be awesome otherwise i'll do it at the next break okay developmentally appropriate practices um this is a loaded comment right what is developmentally appropriate practice right so when I talk about developmentally appropriate practices, um, what I'm really talking about are means of instruction that are connected to kids' developmental stages, right? So not um, a developmentally appropriate practice is very difficult to find in a box, in a curriculum, in something you purchased, because though they may have an estimation that kids at this age can do, real development appropriate practice is being strongly connected and responsive to the kids in front of you. So let's talk a little bit about play. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the reasons for play. And then you're gonna get a break and then we're gonna talk about some classroom practices. So why do we choose play? So a few things linguistically that I say. Number one, I say um, play is my instructional method, right? So um this kind of takes this idea and plugs it into the lingo of you know elementary schools or bigger um you know bigger bigger districts play is my instructional method it's not that things have gone chaotic but play is the method i'm choosing right um i also um I also, you'll see throughout, I, I play along, I play with different language structures. Sometimes folks find it a bit more acceptable to call play inquiry. Um, but what they're inquiring on is things like superheroes and um, supermarkets and nail salons, right? But they are inquiring, right? So sometimes uh, um, if you know Opal School, they refer to it as playful inquiry, right? Um, I used to, the one, the two words that like we can't say anymore are, I, mean, I guess you could say it, but it has such a bad reputation. Trying to stay away from the word centers. Centers is, centers has got a bad rap. Um, and so I try not to say centers to help define this from what centers is sort of perceived as. And also choice time has a bit of a bad rap. So I say play workshop 
just to illustrate the difference. So I'll talk a bit more about that um, as we sort of go through, but I think especially as early childhood folks, if your administrator is coming from an, um, a high school background, from an elementary black background, it's very helpful to be able to say, oh, well, play is our instructional method. Doesn't that sound fancy? Um, or saying like, oh, well, this is our, this is our inquiry time. Right now, it may look like kids are playing because um, they are, but we know that that's one way kids, um, you know, inquire. All right. So here's one study that I often show to help recruit people to my frame of mind. So this study actually comes from Germany, um, uh, and it says this: the children were they looked at they're trying to decide whether they should adopt a play-based or academic-based early childhood curriculum. So they studied kids in both, and they found that the children who went to play-based early childhood centers um, outperformed those who went to academic early childhood centers. I think this makes a ton of sense when you lay it up against the study on social skills. The misconception is that in play-based early childhood places, kids are not getting academics. It's just not true. My four-year-old plays all the time and there's academics happening all over the place. What's this word say? Let's count blank. He has this book where there's a big cake and a line of kids and a stack of plates. And he's very worried that everyone's not gonna get the cake, right? And so what he does on repeat is count the kids count the plates and then try to problem solve how everyone's gonna get the cake. Um, he does this in a playful way. I didn't assign this to him, right? He was looking through the book and he started doing it. There you go, right? Um, kids who are um, playing bus stop might be making signs. Kids who are playing supermarket are gonna, are gonna put price tags on things. However, academically driven, early childhood do not have the opportunities for problem solving, sharing, um, curiosity that play-based early childhood centers. I think people get confused and they think play-based early childhood, they're not learning things. No, they're learning them through play. Academic early childhood centers do not have that concern, right? Well, we're just gonna sit here and learn the alphabet. My child's learning the alphabet because he's obsessed with Super Mario. So he knows that M is for Mario and L is for Luigi, and he wants to know which word says Bowser, right? He's learning the alphabet. We're just not sitting and drilling it every day. That's one of the things I think we have to help folks understand. So one of the other things that I think is really helpful to think about is that this is bigger than just academics, and that is it actually has a brain impact. So Play for a Change is this document that was put out in the UK, um, and it basically synthesizes all of the brain research. And one of the things it finds is that when you look at all the neuroscience around play, there's an impact on the actual brain structure and chemistry. So knowing that information um, makes this next slide, I think, even more impactful, which is what about play deprivation? So um, this is by Stuart Brown. Um, and this article is, um, is, is, I think, worth the read. Um, but essentially, when you study people who haven't had access to a lot of play, you find that there's an actual, um, they grow up with a deficit, right? Particularly around social body and emotional regulation. So the thing that play-based skills help you do is survive uncertainty. Now, I think if there's anything 2019, 2020, 2021 has really shown us is that uncertainty is everywhere, right? And so, there, it seems almost like difficult to process this, but the fact of the matter is people who had a lot of play probably came through this with a bit more ease than people who did not because through play, I have improved resiliency. I might be better with adapting to uncertainty. I can be a little bit, I can have a bit more of a rebound. Like I'd, like I'd love to do a study that went to restaurant owners and was like, how did you play as a child? did your restaurant closed? Like two questions, right? Did you, how soon did you figure out how to do takeout, right? We had a restaurant in our neighborhood that almost immediately started selling groceries, right? So what they, what they weren't selling in food, they started selling in groceries early in the pandemic. I'd love to know how much they played as a child, right? It's sort of a real time. This, um, this idea that I think we talk too often about what happens if kids don't have X amount of time reading, but what if kids don't have X amount of time playing? Right, and so I think this is one of the um, things we want people to be aware of. Um, 
moving moving forward right uh animals the more playful an animal is the better its chances of survival in the wild play is what prepares you for the world not sitting on a rug learning the alphabet now you can still learn the alphabet through play but how do I learn to survive a global pandemic? I learn it by pretending that we ran away from home, right? Like those are the skills that eventually translate. All right, with that, um, let's talk, I've been saying the word play a lot, but I haven't necessarily defined what play is. So I'm gonna use some Peter Gray's conditions of play. Cause I think sometimes we think play is about the stuff you have or the materials. Um, and actually play is a mindset, it's a way of thinking. And once you can really anchor yourself on that idea, you see how play is an instructional method. So play has to be self-chosen and self-directed. There's an emphasis on process over product, which means I'm not asking kids to hand things in at the end of the play. Players determine and agree upon rules. So that's a huge part of executive function, right? How do we um, decide who's gonna, be the, who's gonna be the mom and who's gonna be the cat and who's gonna, and can the cats talk? Um, it's imaginative and there's an active and alert, non-stressed frame of mind. Stressed out kids don't tend to play. One of the things that I want to say to you um, is that uh, play is pleasurable above all. And so kids often demonstrate higher levels of capability because they are feeling pleasure. One of my favorite studies comes from the book, Tools of the Mind, um, which is really about play and executive function. And they, they reference a study where they timed kids sitting in a circle in school. So it was like a kindergarten and they timed how long kids could sit in circle time. Then same kids were playing school and they timed them then. What they found is kids sit longer in a circle when they're playing school than they do in actual school, right? My takeaway from that study is why aren't we playing all day long, right? Um, I've seen it all the time, kids accessing letter sound knowledge that I don't see in more high stakes academic times because they wanna make a bus sign, right? Or kids really trying to sort out what one-to-one -one matches because they're making wedding invitations and they're not sure if they have enough for all the kids, right? You see it, you, we anecdotally can tell it, but there's studies that prove it. Kids tend to outperform themselves when they feel themselves at play. However, feeling yourself at play is not about a particular toy. It's about a mindset. So we're gonna lean on Stuart Brown again to talk about play personalities. This I always do with adults. Um, especially families to just help them understand how play-based learning is not an or, it's not play or work. It's an and, it's a yes and. So Stuart Brown um, is a social scientist and he compiled a bunch of social interviews and came up with these different play personalities. These are really helpful in illustrating the difference between play as an item like a doll and play as a way of thinking. So the first play personality is the joker. So the joker finds a lot of joy in nonsense and silliness. This means um, as an adult, the last time you lost track of time and you just like were like, like completely like, wait, what? Maybe you were joking around with friends. Maybe you were watching a silly movie. Maybe you're reading a funny book, right? The, the silliness and the nonsense is where your joy comes from. These are your kids who like, oh my gosh, that page in No David, that page is everything to them. That but, they're just like, yes, this is definitely emerging in my four-year-old. Oh my goodness, someone toots. It's like the highlight of his day. And then he talks about it for like 40 minutes, right? Um, he just, he loves, he loves to do silly things. He loves, he loves when silly things are happening, right? Okay, so now the storyteller. The storyteller, um, finds joy and pleasure in pretend. As an adult, this manifests in a love of reading or a love of movies, um, a love of daydreaming as you're driving places. This is a very dominant play personality for me. I love me some gothic horror. It started with BC Andrews and it hasn't stopped, right? Like I could sit and read like combination romance, gothic horror from now until forever. Um, give me a movie with some moody elements 
and I am delighted and I am a daydreamer and a half. I'll get in a car and I'll start thinking about if I had like multi-million dollars, what, like, where would I buy homes? And the next thing I know I've driven like 20 miles past the supermarket. So the daydream, it doesn't, you might, you might have fantasies, right. But you also might just like when you're cleaning, you're daydreaming and then you're like lost track of time or you just, your pleasure is just like reading, like could be like realistic fiction, could be nonfiction, just, could just be like a trashy romance novel. Like maybe you and Alyssa Cole and a glass of iced tea is like your summer goal, right? That's the storyteller. As a kid, this is the kid when you're like time to line up and they hop over there like a frog, right? Or um, this might be the kid who um, they come in and they have a British accent suddenly and you're like, where? what's happening here, right? That's the storyteller. They're always engaging and pretend. The maker creator, the maker creator finds a lot of joy in making things. You don't have to be good at it. That's a key, right? Because if you're like, oh, because it's process over product. So you could, you could be a maker creator and you can knit things for everyone and they could be horrible. That's okay. That's still your play personality. Um, you might love to bake or cook or do hair or arrange furniture or more traditionally paint or draw or garden, but you just like to create things. This is another strong play personality. Shows up a lot in, um, I like to arrange things just so. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm like constantly trying to make our home look like a crate and barrel magazine spread where I have like the Afghan at like the, the, the 45 degree angle and like the book right? Does not work with everyone else who lives in my house, but like, man, I feel such satisfaction when I've like created a like dollhouse vignette, right? And as a kid, I love dollhouse, love dioramas, love making that kind of stuff. Um, but this might also be baking or gardening. As a kid, you just love to draw and make and do things, create, build, right? This was where you found joy and pleasure. The director. So director finds joy and pleasure in planning. This is really counterintuitive to a lot of folks. Like we'll be like, wait, what? What do you mean planning is fun? Do you love to get ready for a vacation? Do you love to look at the guidebook? Do you love to think about when you're gonna eat where? Do you love to organize? Do you love to throw a party, right? Do you love to think about the decorations and the, right? Um, this is the director. The love, the joy and pleasure is in the planning. As a kid, this can sometimes come across as sort of bossy. So this is what the director sounds like. We're gonna play restaurant and I'm gonna be the chef and you're gonna be, you're gonna come in and you're gonna say you want this and blah, 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 right? Like their pleasure is in directing it. So my sister's play personality. When we were kids, she would tell us how we were gonna play. We're gonna play and you're gonna be the bad witch and I'm gonna be the, right? Like you can imagine older sister. Um, but it has like in this day, um, she used to come of her own free will and hang backing paper on my bulletin board because she found it to be such a pleasurable event. Given my own free will, I would use like, it would be hanging off sideways. Like I would not want to organize it perfectly and align things and measure and use a T square. And like, it brought her such joy. She just said to me, the idea of a good day is organizing a pantry. I was like, please come over and do this for me, right? That's the director. If that, if any of that sounds right to you, that's you. All right. So as a kid, the, um, the explorer, the explorer play personality finds a lot of joy in the unknown. What's gonna like, like what, maybe it's a new, maybe it's a walk I'm going on for the first time. Maybe it's a book I'm reading. Um, you know, I just like the, un the unknown aspect and I like discovering it. These are your kids who your direct instruction is their worst nightmare. Right, but if you're like, no one's ever seen this book before, they'll be like, I want it. Um, uh, all of those things, um, you know, what's behind the cabinet? What's this? That's the explorer play personality, the competitor. The competitor likes to make things into games and win them. What does this look like as an adult? Do you try to get your data in before your colleagues and then feel very smug when you're like, did you get your data in? I did, right? Do you try to get places faster than your navigation? Do you take the airline's 50 pound weight limit as like a, a, like a 
a test of your packing power, right? If any of those things are true about you, and it may be sports, you maybe really love to watch sports or you might like to play sports, but it's the game-like aspect. When things are games, you find it super fun, right? That's the competitor play personality. For kids, the, the <laughs> um, that was a good one. Okay, sorry, in the chat if you're looking. Um, so when the, the, the um, when this is kids, when you say time to line up, they're like, I'm the first one. These are the kids who love table points games or who's the first one to get packed up. This is one, this is a very strong play personality in me. I love making things games as an adult. As a 43 year old woman, I have thought to myself, can I cross the street only stepping on the white lines, right? Like that is a thing that sounded fun to me. And then I did it right because of this. I would bring that energy into the classroom and be like, who's going to pack up first? Like five kids would be super into it and 20 of them would be crying about it. That's sort of that overextension of a play personality. Like that's when you think about um, Deborah and Etta Sullivan's like share the space and the power. That's me using my place personality as a, as a universal. I didn't realize it wasn't universal, right? Some kids want to do that. Some kids do not. Okay, the collector. Pretty self-explanatory. The only real nuance in the collector is um, that sometimes what you collect are experiences. So my brother-in-law has been to every University of Michigan homecoming game. Um, to like skip a University of Michigan homecoming game is to like, you know, betray his loved one in a deep-seated way. That's not an actual item, that's an experience he collects, right? So as a kid, these are kids who come in from outside and like, look at what I found. This is my partner's um, play personality, he collects music in the form of vinyl records and CDs and tapes and tickets. It's a, it's a problem because I would throw everything out given, given the opportunity. Um, it's also showing up as another one of my child's play personalities. We have a stick collection that is overwhelming our, our, um, our, our outdoor space, right? So every time we go on a walk, he's like, I need this stick for my stick collection. Okay, the kinesthete. The kinesthete finds a lot of joy and pleasure in movement. You don't have to be good at it, but the second you have some free time, you wanna get up and move. You might um, love gardening for the physical aspect of it. You might love walking. You might love um, riding your bike. These are kids who find such joy and pleasure. You can see it on their face and their movement. These are all of them in a list. Take a moment, think about the ones that comprise you most strongly and drop it into the chat. You are more than one. I am a storyteller, a maker, and a competitor. Those are my three dominant play personalities. Drop yours into the chat. While you're doing that, I'm going to enjoy some coffee. Okay, so as you're typing it in, this is just another lens to see people in your life, right? Like the other thing, again, tying this back into some of the earlier work um, is really understanding that this is a unique combination in each of us. There's not one play personality that everyone has, and there's not one that's better than anyone else's. We might feel more comfortable with our own type of play personality. Like if we are not a competitor, we might not feel comfortable around competitors. Or if we're not a collector, we might feel frustrated by the collector. But the thing to remember is we are just one of many. Now what Stuart Brown says is that as, as adults, we apply our play personality to things in life, to activities, right? Because it's a mindset. So exercise, which many of us do not love, exercise can actually be a form of play depending on how you activate your play personality. So the explorer might be more willing to exercise if they do it by taking walks in new neighborhoods or bike rides in new neighborhoods or runs in new neighborhoods. Um, the competitor might be more willing to exercise. There's an app called 
strides or something like that. And you can, the more you run something, you can win it. So it's a bunch of people on the app and whoever runs the, the location the most wins it. So you're just trying to win tiles for yourself by exercising essentially. Um, the storyteller might actually find the app Zombies Run really impactful because in the app Zombies Run, your running is part of the story. Every time you, you get sent on a mission and then throughout that mission, you get, you sort of hear the story of this post-apocalyptic world and then zombies start chasing you and you're supposed to run faster, right? Um, a joker might be more likely to exercise if they go with someone who makes them laugh or if they see it as an opportunity to listen to a funny podcast or um, you know, a funny book on tape. A collector might be more likely to exercise. I have a friend who's definitely a collector. She, she did it for the shirts. She would go to, um, she would sign up for races for the shirts. She's never trying to win them, right? She just, she's got every race shirt there ever was known to man, right? Um, the key here is not what you do, it's how you find joy in what you're doing. And that is how you make the whole day feel like play. It's not that you buy a lot of fun toys and you yourself are constantly putting on a performance and that um, you make wacky noises all the time. It's not about any of that. It's about opening the space so that kids understand that their play personalities are reflected in everything you do. So when it comes to something traditionally academic, reading, right? What are the ways we might engage and explore in the idea of reading? Honestly, where's Waldo books, right? Or um, here's a book no one's ever seen before or map, you know, atlases, right? Like, here, like there's lots of texts I might put in kids' hands where suddenly reading doesn't feel like a slog. It feels like I'm exploring something. How do I get the maker involved in reading? Um, perhaps it's reading with the intention to make something. Maybe I'm reading a how-to book, how to bead, how to do origami, or maybe I'm responding to books through making. I am gonna make a diorama. I am gonna make some story play. The storyteller is going to be drawn into fiction, but maybe with nonfiction, I show them some narrative nonfiction books, right? The kinesthete might love to read when we get them moving in reading. Use one of those foot cycles, bounce on a ball, right? The collector, you're going to sell on the idea of reading through series books. Look at all of them, and I have all of them, or let's see which ones we can find from the library. The competitor might respond well. Um, to books that, um, uh, to the idea of, um, you know, trying to see how many books did you read today? How many pages did you read today? The Joker might really benefit from some books that get them laughing, silly pictures, silly things. The director might love the idea of planning their reading. I always wonder about those reading journals because that is like so, I, so not my speed, but then I know someone who loves it and she's a director, of course she loves it. She loves to get out her little gel pens and use her journal and write down what she read, right? That's like that, that directing sensibility that she's connected to her reading. When I do this with families, I put the word cleaning up inside of this. And I say, you know, many kids don't wanna clean up from what they're doing. So imagine your child, think about what they really like to do when they play, how would you use it? to help them clean up. If I say to my four-year-old, we're gonna clean up now, 30% success rate. If I say, can you be a bulldozer and bulldoze all the blocks back in the box? 90% success rate, right? Like it's, everything still gets cleaned up, right? The, the task is still accomplished. The way it was accomplished is slightly different, right? So, um, this is one thing to think about when we talk about playful classrooms. It doesn't mean kids aren't reading and writing. It doesn't mean kids aren't doing math. It just means the way they're approaching it is going to be different. And this again, it pushes to this idea of inclusivity. I will never say to everyone, we're all gonna read silly books because some kids don't want to, 
right? And I'm not going to say, we're all going to keep a, we're all going to make a plan for our reading because some kids don't want to. It's finding different ways to invite each child in to find their way. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to pause here for actually a little break. I'm back after your uh, break. I managed to spill an entire cup of coffee on myself, hence the Celine Dion like outfit change. So, um, you know, it was a break for all of us. Uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, feedback, feel free to drop them in the chat now. Um, we're going to have another opportunity for you to go into your breakouts in a little bit. But if you want to feel free to chat with each other in the chat or ask questions or anything like that, um, we're about to talk about classroom practice now. So, to synthesize where we are in this moment, we took a look at some of the mindset stuff we can shift. Um, we can shift, we took a look at some of the research and thinkers we might wanna be bringing into um, our next year as we think about how to make it a better year for every child. So now let's look at what this actually looks like in a practical classroom type of way. So I'm gonna go through three big ideas with you. And in the words of my father-in-law, it's gonna be a bit of a Whitman sampler, which means you're gonna get a taste of a few things, but not you're not getting a full box of the caramels right now. Should you want a full box of the caramels, um, you know, that's, we could, we could always talk more. Um, but uh, this is just like, what are some little, in three hours, like what are some things that we might begin to think about or shift? And I'll try to direct you to some things you might read and think about um, to build some of these practices. What I hope um, will happen is some of it will feel familiar to you. Um, some of it might affirm your practices and some of it, and you might have some moments where you say, oh, I could do more of this or I could shift this or I could talk about it like this. Um, there's this, uh, a friend of mine taught me about the it sounds very fancy. It's called a plus delta framework. Have you ever heard of this plus delta framework? Um, it sounds space-like, which is why I like it. But essentially, instead of going like positive and negative, um, you say positive and delta. And what that means is, what are the things you're affirming and maintaining? And the delta is, what are the changes you're going to make? Rather than writing under minus, you know, like I only do play after lunch. Under delta, you might write move play to a more prominent position in the day. Right, so the delta is about the changes you want to make, not beating yourself up about something that you want to change. Right, so the plus delta framework might be a way that you think about this and that what am I already doing? What's affirmed and what changes might I make as opposed to, you know, I'm not doing this or whatever. Um, the idea with the delta is that you also use a verb to start it. So instead of writing more play you write something actionable, move play to morning, right? Like, so it's, it's, a, it's a verb or something that you could do. All right, that's it. I just like also saying plus delta framework because it sounds, sounds like I'm doing like, like NASA level stuff. All right, back to sharing screen. Let's talk about the changes. So um, just for a brief second about as it loads, the image, um, when I was choosing an image for this slide, I was thinking about how um, once you start to believe these things, you might only feel comfortable changing a little, but it starts to color everything, right? Once I stop believing play is a specific time of day and a mindset, it's nearly impossible for it not to infiltrate everything, right? And so, nothing here is about doing more as much as it's about shifting the lens, right? Saying, um, how, how does play support this? How does play enrich this? How does play deepen this? Not when will we play, but how will we play, right? So um, for some of you, it might be about rethinking existing structures and practices. I'm not saying to you, and now you need to add another half an hour because no one has another half an hour to, to add, but rethinking or shifting some of those existing, that's hence the visual. A little drop can change the color of everything. Okay, so um, a quote that I, really goes with don't blame the lettuce, right? Um, is this idea that the good gardener works to build fertile soil that can sustain a whole ecosystem of different plants with different strengths and beauties and with different weaknesses and different difficulties too. 
This is Alison Goldnick. She's a developmental psychologist. She wrote the book, The Gardener and the Carpenter, one of my favorite books about caregiving and teaching that I could possibly tell you. Um, one of the things she talks about is any, one spe any single species success is um, based on its ability to be diverse um, and the inclusivity around diversity. Look at what's happening with the coronavirus right now. Um, the worst news in the world is variance because it's becoming more diverse more diversity equals more survival. The opposite those the the we something we want to get rid of, we want a lot of the same. Anything we want to thrive, we want to encourage diversity and difference. Part of the thinking there is you don't know what the world holds. We need lots of different people. We need kids who are going to be the first ones in and the kids who hang back and say, "Was that a good idea?" The entire thesis statement of the, her book is don't try to change or shape children. Just help them be the best version of themselves that they want to be. It's not about having this specific skill set or this specific skill set. We need every type of person in the world, right? And so schools shouldn't be trying to, to um, she says, hothouse or greenhouse. Oh, kids only thrive in this very specific, right? But that we're making spaces where more akin to a healthy thriving field of wildflowers than you know a very specific style of plant i think about this in regards to um you know sometimes we have schools have like mission statements this is the type of student we will produce right um and often that's mired in deep set cultural beliefs um specific to particular communities. It doesn't always have the, the um, um, input of all the stakeholders in children's lives. Um, and so rather than saying, we'll produce this type of child, we say, tell us about your child. How can we help them be the best version of themselves? What do you value? What do you see as your child's gifts? What do you see as your child's strengths? To me, one of the biggest issues with strengths-based teaching is strength according to who, right? Because I might come from a household that sees com competitiveness as a strength, um, and they um, and someone else might see competitiveness as a as a weakness, right? This is a conversation we have to have in communities about what how do we help each child thrive. I would say the only mindset that every child needs to develop is that everyone matters. Everyone's voice matters, whether you're, whether you're shyer and you hang back, whether you're aggressive and speak forward, whether you're um, likely to take a jump, whether you're likely to watch someone take a jump, that every mindset matters, or sorry, that every person matters is the mindset that, that matters, right? Not that we want kids to be aggressive or, um, or, um, uh, kids are you know one thing or another but just that we all have a space in the garden one of the things that um you may know i'm, I'm gonna uh, i'm glad miriam you're enjoying the uh, gardening metaphors because here comes another um which is that there are certain plants that are partner plants so you should always plant beans with tomatoes right because one gives nitrogen one takes nitrogen um there's shade plants that do better under shade there's ones that do better in the sun there's there's a place in the garden for everyone, as long as our garden is, is well planned, right? And so I often think, you know, about this like, give me five, hands to yourself. Some kids learn better smushed up against another kid. If another kid also learns better smushed up, let them smush up against each other. And the kid who doesn't want anyone touching them can be the one who's in the space by themselves, right? Like why, why the one size fits all? One size fits all is like watering everyone on Thursday right? Like watering every plant on Thursday. Every plant doesn't need water on Thursday. Some need it three times a week, some need it once a week. But any one size rule is going to naturally create um, inequities. So again, it's about the environment. It's about the systems that encourage kids to grow and thrive. I highly recommend this book. And Miriam, if you like the gardening metaphors, you're going to love this book. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about some um, times and experiences in the day where we might have play. There's lots of them. I'm going to talk about three. So one I'm going to call play workshop. I'll define what that is when we get a little bit closer uh, when we when when I break it down. Um, but that's one thing I'm going to talk about. The next is invitations and explorations, and the final is story play. 
The two I'm not going to talk about is recess. Um, if you would like to read and think critically about recess, I highly encourage um, um, Big Body Play by Francis Carlson. So Big Body Play by Francis Carlson is, um, it's a, a National Association for the Education of Young Children, NIAC. Some people say NIAC, some people say other things, but um, publication. Uh, she writes very specifically about um, sort of the big rough play and the type of play that's really helpful for kids and ways to make that work. Big body play, Francis Carlson. Go read her about recess. Um, tabletop experiences, things like puzzles and stamps and, and all those sorts of things are important for kids. This is, I, I sometimes feel like if I could give one gift to the world, it would be taking everything that um, we have in a, in a play-based classroom and saying why you do it. So everyone would have it at their fingertip. But for example, puzzles are important for kids because it helps them with visual processing, right? So visual processing is something we're gonna need to read, to write, to do math. Um, we wanna have kids engaging in um, sensory experiences for like a thousand and one reasons, but not the least of which is that helps me mitigate pressure, which will ultimately help me with, with writing, right? It will also help me with interacting with others. We want to have um, stamping because that's fine motor and stickers are fine motor. Everything has a purpose, right? Everything has a reason. That's why it was in, it's in schools. Um, some of those tabletop experiences, though, can overwhelm the day because kids stay quieter at them. And so the thing I'll say is I'm not anti-tabletop experiences, but I find classrooms have a lot of them. So I'm never in a classroom being like, where's the stamp station, right? Because there are stamps out for kids. And I'm never like, where's the iPad time? Kids are at iPads, right? But it's some of the bigger, louder stuff that can sometimes get pushed away because it looks a little chaotic. So just because I'm not talking about it doesn't mean I don't think it has value. I do think it has value, but I think it's also present in many spaces. Okay, um, so let's talk about these in detail. So play workshop, why is it not choice time? So play workshop is a time of the day, daily, 30 to 45 minutes to an hour, whatever you can make happen, um, where kids are playing collaboratively around themes or materials. This is, um, the key words here are collaborative, themes and ideas. Um, Play Workshop has a structure to it. It has, um, it has sort of a predictable, um, progression of experiences, but it's different than choice time because it's not who wants blocks today, who wants to go to housekeeping today, right, which is sort of the more traditional view of choice time. You can do play, play workshop in place of choice time because kids will get some of the same meaningful activities, um, but it's not, it's not the who wants to go to blocks today question. It's not who wants to go to um, you know, stamps today, who wants to go to art today. So let's talk a little bit about how it's different. So play workshop, this is in case of next year. So I'm gonna talk about it in real, real time, but if it, you're virtual for any reason next year or you're socially distanced, physically distanced next year, I have this sort of cheat sheet over to the side. So there's a gathering. The gathering is five to 10 minutes. In the gathering, we're problem solving together. Friends, cleaning up from play workshop yesterday took 45 minutes. Can we talk about some ways that that could go smoother today? What are your thoughts around it? Friends, yesterday at play workshop, some people were saying you can't play with us. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Friends, yesterday at play workshop, the lots of kids were saying, someone's not sharing. Let's talk about that. Friends, you know, those are some, some behavior ones, but it might also be like, can we, let's look at what some friends made in the block area. Let's talk about how they did it. I want these to be conversations because I want to communicate that you are problem solvers and we as a community can solve problems. So a gathering um, gives us a chance to communicate to kids. We are the type of community who comes together and talks out things. Right, we are the type of community who comes together and shares ideas. We are the type of community who comes together and learns from each other. It's five to 10, maybe, maybe on the off chance 15 minutes, but not more than that, right? 
Now, I'm a big believer in having a, um, a, a choice board for kids to select in the beginning of the year. Um, and one of the things I'll say too is it's really important that it be an equitable system. I, I would strongly discourage you saying, who wants to go to blocks today? And then choosing from the raised hands. That's just, an, that's, that's too chaotic a system for a lot of kids. Uh, the one that I found the easiest is we make a name chart regard anyway, we just start with the first name on the name chart, they choose first on the first day, and then you go down in order, and then the second day, the second name chooses first, and they go down in order, the third day chooses their name first, and they go down in order. Um, there's a couple reasons why I, it doesn't have to be that system, but you want something equitable and you don't want it to be merit based. Whoever comes to the rug first chooses first, it's just not fair. Um, and what we want is for this to be a reliable, safe time for kids. The kids who are having the hard day are the ones who need it the most anyway. So why would we prohibit access to it? So um, that's the system that I found the most reliable and the most sustaining. So kids could just do it on their own without me. First thing in the morning, kids would, um, I would just have someone who would help every your turn to choose, your turn to choose while we were doing other things. Um, and kids would put their names in. Um, in the beginning, as we're just getting this up and rolling, the play is really about the materials. Kids are saying, I want to use cardboard, I want to use collage, I want to use the sand table, as kids get to know what materials can do. But as soon as you start to hear kids generating ideas, your choice board shifts, your play workshop board shifts to represent that. So someone might say, we should play restaurant. So the thing that goes on is restaurant as opposed to blocks or um, cardboard. Uh, what makes a good center is multi-purpose, right? So anything that can be used in a variety of ways. Kids will have access to more single serve toys at other points during the day. Um, you know, I, I would have things like, uh, you know, the Thomas trains out first thing in the morning, but it wasn't a play workshop material because I wanted kids to be working on innovating. Again, I got a whole book on this, so I could talk to you about this for like several days. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the to to some bits more details, then we'll go. So um, at the end of kids playing, and this is the way my thinking has shifted. I do let kids roam. In the beginning, I wouldn't, but I do let kids roam if they need to because I do want them to be in charge of their own self regulation. If I see someone who's like a serial roamer, they just can't settle into a place. That's information for me to help that child make some connections, right? Or to rethink my materials. In the if you saw me in the past, I would have been like, kids stay in their choice. I'm less like that now. I'm like, kids choose what they need. They need that experience to move, especially, especially in the beginning. And then at the end, there's a reflection. I want to build a reflection in so we can talk about some mindset stuff. What'd you do today when your tower fell down? You guys decided to build it a different way. That showed a lot of flexibility or you guys look like you were having a problem getting started. Can you talk us through how you solved that, right? Or tell us, show us what you made, right? We sometimes reflect on what we did. We sometimes reflect on problems we solved. We sometimes reflect on ongoing problems we're still working on. Um, uh, Miriam, you're wondering as they roam, should it be intentional? They move their choice on the border, totally casual. I've moved to casual. So when kids are kids are choosing their starting point, but then we, I'm trying to teach them how to sort of measure, is there space for me? How do I join something that's in progress? What are you guys doing here? There's a whole bunch of sort of social skill work that needs to be developed. Some kids have, some kids don't, um, but I haven't, I haven't um, made it. So they have to, having said that, if you do it more formally, um, Miriam, if you're imagining principal observations, the thing I would say to your principal is, we're working on social cueing, we're working on executive function, we're working on, um, we're working on, you might like list out. So as kids approach a center, they're learning to say, what are you playing here? Can I join? We're working on speaking and listening standards. We're working on, um, you know, all of those bits and pieces. I'm sure if you go through that kids assessment, you'll find like eight or nine things that you could say. Asking to join a center is practice in X, Y, and Z. Okay, so this is just a visual of what it will look like once kids get it up and rolling. So all of them are kids submitted. So um, it's the one on the left is a little bit harder to see, but you can see how it's a self-run space. 
So um, this is starting in the day. This is the little the, the child on the left. There is our um, that's their job today is to help help get everyone in their spots. Um, it's low down. There's a step ladder. She needs to get to that higher one. Um, so it's meant to be, this is about independence. This is about child run classrooms. Every single one of the suggestions comes from a child. I had around 28 kids this year. So the number of centers is high. Um, typically though, I say you want four to five to six kids together because collaboration is part of it. Um, you can see a couple of cues there. This is later in the year, so it's fallen apart a little bit. In the beginning, I dot out how many kids can fit in a space um, because they'll always, they're so savvy. They'll be like, look, there's more room and they slide the cards over. So the dots, it's a name per dot, one-to-one -one matching. But um, some of the ones you can see, there's a family one. There's this one down here. This green one is playing golf. Uh, there's still a Legos up because some of these didn't, you know, the suggestions may not match kids on the one on the right, different year, different, different style. It was magnet board. Um, this child, these kids, um, one of the kids suggested nail salon. And so these are the kiddos who wanted to join nail salon um, and play nail salon together. And so I'm just going to show you some images. Oops, I'm not going to show you some images. Surprise. Um, but so what are some things kids are doing there in the nail salon? Um, they built it out of blocks. So they made a space using the blocks. They even made themselves a little foot spa. Um, they took construction paper and made um, nail polish to bottles so that there were colors. They had an, a clipboard for appointments, right? And so this is where some of that casual nature, I can just walk over there and go get my nails done, right? Or um, we talked a little bit about applying for a job, right? So if you wanna go play there, you have to apply for a job. You have to say, can I come work here, right? And so then they'll teach you what to do. So it's um, in the golf school, right? This one kiddo like learned to play golf and then he wanted to hold a golf school. And so kids could learn, go and learn to play golf. And he had built clubs out of some paper towel tubes and he had taped on some, um, uh, some other cardboard we had. He had made some, he was using those puff balls as balls. He had made some holes with cups, right? And like he was teaching kids how to play golf. So um, this is what play workshop feels like. It's not as kids are moving. There's a lot of making stuff. Um, one of the ways, one of the bits of research I use, not to necessarily defend this, but to just shore it up, is one of the questions NASA asks job applicants at their Jet Propulsion Lab, which is where they do literal rocket science, is how did you play as a child? Um, they came about that question because when they were just looking, they found they weren't getting the type of divergent thinking um, when they were looking at things like, tell me about your time at MIT. You can be a top performer at school and not be a divergent thinker. So this talk to me about how you played as a child um, helped them start to find some of the um, uh, applicants that maybe weren't top of the field at MIT, but had a way of thinking that really supported the work they do. The um, um, shoot, MacArthur Grant. So the MacArthur Grant, they give out um, every year, it's like a lot of money in the six figures, basically to people doing innovative work. And they say, keep doing this work. MacArthur Jan Grant winners are more likely, so if you compare them to peers in their field, MacArthur Grant winners were more likely to engage in fantasy play as a child, right? The play isn't a static thing that only exists in childhood. It plants the roots of these trees of thinking that are essential in adulthood, right? So play doesn't look like play as you get older, but it's a root system that allows you to forever be able to think differently and problem solve and be adaptable. Okay, um, now let's talk about another shift we can make. So lots of us run centers in our room. We might run literacy centers and math centers, right? And I wanna invite us to think about a more play-based shift, which we're gonna call invitations. Okay, so invitations are different than centers for a couple of reasons. They are not task driven. You do not hand anything in at the end of an invitation. They are also self-regulated. That means that I am choosing where to go when, and when I feel done, I moved myself to another place. That doesn't mean there are not 
boundaries. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but let me run through this. So I worked in a public school and I was a kindergarten teacher and, and we were, um, we needed to have reading as part of our day as a way to adjust that to what I felt more appropriate and what some of what I had read felt more appropriate. We had literacy exploration time. We also had math exploration time. What did that look like for us? It was 45 minutes of time that started again with a gathering. Within that gathering, we might explain some of the different explorations kids could be doing. Um, we might be problem solving some issues of noise or cleanup or materials. Um, one of the things that I really, um, I have just a master teacher that I work with named Erin and she was introducing watercolors as a literacy expert, as an exploration. And watching the way that she presented watercolors to her kids, um, it just really struck me how much care she invited into the materials. Like it makes me so bummed out to see art materials just like smashed on the floor or carefully constructed things, right? Cause that's not how we want kids to leave the world, right? And so she talked really clearly about a process. She's like, I have a new exploration for us today, watercolors. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how we use them. We take the, um, um, we dip, swipe, paint. That was the phrase she gave them, dip in the water, swipe across the color, paint, and then we dip, swipe, paint. Dip, swipe, paint. She gave them this little mantra. Um, she treated the materials with a lot of respect. Just watching her and then watching the kids kind of approach it with some seriousness, I, I reflected back on my own habits of just being like, there's watercolors out. Um, and so she introduced it through this gathering. If you're interested today, we're gonna have watercolors out and this is how you might use them. It was also very, she had um, a pitcher of water out that wasn't very big. She had two like little measuring cups of water out with the spouts and kids had little cups of water. And then there was a big bucket in the middle to dump your dirty water. So when I, when I was done, I dumped my dirty water in the bucket in the middle and I left my empty cup. And then when I came to it, I could take the little small pitcher fill up my cup to the line she had she had drawn a little line and leave it right it was so self-sustaining that she never had to come over now the first time it was out there she sat there right so as kids came but then once kids kind of got the rhythm of it she she went on her way to do other things right and that's getting to know a material later she might attach a bigger idea to the material around lines, around stories, around, around um, illustration. But just first that use of the materials, getting that independence. Another master teacher I, I, I worked with um, or had the pleasure of seeing, I should say, um, she taught three-year-olds and I watched a three-year-old get all the materials for painting and paint without a single adult having to help her. And it was all because of setup. The, this was later in the process, but all the paint was in condiment um, squeeze jars. So, you know, those like ketchup, to, like mustard, skinny, she had clear condiment paint jars so that the kids could see the colors. They were in a condiment basket. So the child picked up the condiment basket, squeezed the color she wanted into a tray, got the paper, painted, put the condiment jar basket back and washed her thing when she was done, right? And just that simple nudge, painting was one of those things that I was always like, oh, I gotta get the paints out, I gotta get the brush, I gotta what? She had none of that because she had, she had, had this really sort of careful, thoughtful um, way in which the materials became highly accessible and then had taken the time to explain, like you don't squeeze the whole condiment jar out, you do a little bit right? Like she had gone through that work with them early on. And then as time progressed, you saw these three-year-olds using wire cutters, right? There was just so much kids were able to do because of how it'd been set up. Anyway, I digress, but that's what that gathering time is about. Then kids are exploring. I, the teacher might be pulling some small groups. I might be assessing. I might be working one-on-one -on -one with kids. In around winter of kindergarten, I primarily use that time to start meeting with reading groups. So kids were doing literacy exploration, I'd be pulling some, some reading groups, right? Or I'd be pulling some kids who need some support on things. In the fall, I was a lot more in the stuff they were doing. And I tried to kind of bring myself back to that again and again and again. Um, but 
once things were up and rolling, it was very easy for me to pull three small groups and then spend my in-between time checking in on kiddos. Um, and then at the end, you have a reflection. Talk to us about what you made. What did you do? Look at what they tried. I'm just gonna show you um, a picture um, in a second of a sample one. But Margie Carter is um, someone who writes about these types of explorations and invitations. She calls them explorations. Um, essentially, she, she gives sort of these different categories of how you might generate them. And then what are the different things we want kids to be doing there? Here's a sample. Um, nope, just kidding. Here's, um, uh, for those of you who have um, administrators who are gonna wanna know the standards for everything, um, this is one way to think about it, right? So I can, if I know that I want kids to be retelling stories, one way I'm going to do that is make an invitation with some blocks and some characters and a read aloud. Kids will be inclined to retell the story using those materials. And then the questions I ask and the lens I wear helps me find that as well. Now, I know that um, uh, the kids assessment gives lots of beautiful examples of that in a rubric as well. But let's say, for example, I haven't seen a lot of kids um, telling narratives, right? We haven't, uh, the writing, I, or I know we're moving into that. I'm gonna set up an invitation that encourages kids towards narrative. So one of the things that we used to do was take kids' photos and put them on blocks. Now I have a physical paper doll of myself, right? Now we put those in with a whole hodgepodge of materials um, one of the invitations we had was make your house, right? And so kids could use loose parts and shoeboxes to make your house. Then we use the houses and the, and the, um, we talked about the community. It went as part of our community study. We added different things in our community, the school, the grocery store, the, this, now we have ourselves. Kids are going to the park to play. They're literally bringing their little paper doll over to the pretend park. And what do I do immediately after that? Friends, let's tell some stories, right? Because they've just played it out. Um, so this as a way to just sort of think through, and you might have some different standards highlighted at different centers, but it's not a task. I'm not saying, and now write down and hand in, right? So this is one framing. I'm working on one-to-one -one tagging. How can I set an invitation up that's really gonna encourage that, right? Um, that's the kind of thinking you might bring to these explorations. Okay, so the nuts and bolts of it, and here's one that I'm gonna talk through. Um, it's always an invitation. So this one has a shared reading book we've done, Owl Babies, right? So the kids have heard Owl Babies. We've read it as a shared reading. It also has a nonfiction book set up. It has a few stuffed owls. What you can't see off to the side is also papers and markers, right? Um, so, what we, uh, the invitation is just, hello owls, how's your day? What can kids do here? Some kids are gonna reread the shared reading book. That's one of, that's that's standard 10, right? They're engaging in, in, in grade appropriate text complexity, whatever. Some kids are gonna look through the nonfiction book. The nonfiction book is helping with our reading information. Some kids might be comparing the nonfiction book to the fiction book. Some kids are gonna take those owls out and act out owl babies, right? What are they doing? They're retelling with key details. Some kids are gonna take the owls and make up their own stories. What are they doing? Creating a sequence narrative. Some kids are gonna take those owls and look at them against the nonfiction book, right? What are they doing? They're essentially creating informational text with words. Some kids are gonna take the paper and make a story. Some kids are gonna take the paper and make a label. And some kids are gonna take the paper and they're gonna make a paper airplane. And I'm also gonna say, that's super interesting. Tell me about that, right? Um, it's, it is a, Sw invitations are Swiss army knives. The child comes to it and can find a way or a material that helps them think differently or deeper. A good invitation, and I've had plenty of bad invitations, but a good invitation um, deepens over time. So another way that I can support this, right, is if a child goes over there and they use the owls and make up their own story, I tell the kids that, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what Sarah just did. Sarah was at the owls and they made up their own owl baby story. And look, they even made it into a book 
in paper. Let's leave that in the invitation. Or I might say, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what Miriam did. Miriam, Miriam looked at the, the owls we had and then she looked in the owl book and she said, oh my goodness, I think these owls are blank owls. She was trying to figure out what they were. Isn't that interesting? Right? I'm going to share that in that reflection or just to kind of grow some of that work. There's a phrase in a math um, philosophy called cognitive guided instruction, low floor, high ceiling. What that basically means is there's something for everyone, but no upper limit. A worksheet is both high floor, low ceiling. There's just a narrow space in which kids can work. Low floor, high ceiling says, maybe all I do is flip and look at the pictures and then I leave. Fine. Maybe I go there and I make my own owl book. Great. Right? This is, there's lots of ways in which you can interact with the materials. Okay, so now let's talk about story play. So story play <laughs> is, is something that can happen with anything. And I couldn't really categorize it except to say that in invitations, in, um, in, in play workshops, in reading, in writing, in our day, we want to find lots of opportunities to engage kids in story play or small world play. Um, why? There's a couple of reasons. So let's take a look at them. So story play or fantasy play has three fundamental things it does for kids. One, it helps with their mental health. Kids play out the things that are in their world that bring them stress or fear kind of the same way that you might talk something to death, right? Kids are not going to say to you, <clears throat> it's like, oh, my, my, <clears throat> my dad lost his job and there's a lot of stress in the house, right? But what they will do is play a game in which the dad gets eaten by a crocodile, or they'll play a game with some frightening element in it, right? Or they'll play a game where they're the dad and they're yelling at everyone. Oftentimes kids use play as a way to work through big feelings. My little guy loves Super Mario and at the same time is scared of Bowser. So what does he do? He wants to play Super Mario and sometimes he's Bowser and sometimes I have to be Bowser and he defeats me. When I feel powerless, I become more powerful in my play. A few things to say about this. If at any point you feel alarmed about a child's play, please talk to your social worker, your therapist, whoever you need to. You are not a trained social worker, right? Kids will bring things into our play that alarm us or concern us. And I want to say to you, make sure you go talk to someone about that. I also want to say at the same time, it's really healthy for kids to be playing out big themes in their play. It's not every year I taught kindergarten, there'd be some sort of play scenario where the where people were dying. That's not necessarily an unhealthy thing. It's just, I'm scared of the concept of death. So I'm going to play it. And then when I see it, it stops being so scary to me. I've like made sense of it. Vivian Paley writes about how um, there's only like seven themes in the world, loneliness, fear. The only difference between war and peace and cat family is the degree of experience. Right, so when we play cat family and the cats are arguing with each other, I'm basically exploring all the same themes as war and peace, just with my own level of experience. I love looking at cat family through the lens of war and peace. I love looking at the cat family play through critical literacy. What do kids understand about story structure? What do kids understand about motivation? What do kids understand about character, right? Like it's not just cat family. To the kids, it's just cat family, but to us, it's so much more. Um, this is a good time for me to say something about gun and weapons play. There is no um, uh, correlation found in research between guns and weapons play and further violence. There is correlation between kids who don't respect boundaries and for kids who um, constantly ignore stops and things like that um, to, to, to concerning behaviors. But here's the thing, if I engage in gunplay and someone says stop and I stop, that's actually very healthy. If I play tea party and I keep shoving tea on you, even when you say stop, that's not healthy behavior, right? So the sometimes we get um, distracted by the theme of the play, not the behavior in the play. 
right? And so the theme might be we're, we're playing superheroes. There's going to be violence that comes up in that. But if the players back off each other, if the players understand what too far is, if the players self-handicap or say, okay, we won't do that anymore, that's the best sign of a healthy development. But if you're playing dolls and I keep pushing my doll on you and you say, stop, I don't like it. And I don't listen to that. Or I keep running over what you're saying. That's not healthy behavior. So we have a tendency to watch certain play a lot closer, but we shouldn't all play to kids. There's no difference between superheroes and tea party, right? Um, you might have school rules or you might be in a community that's extra sensitive to it. And so I'm not saying, oh, you should let all things go or whatever, but um, don't be distracted. Don't be confused by a child wanting to play with weapons as being somehow more um, um, aggressive because sometimes the aggression takes lots of different forms. I will tell you, I was a child with, I spent quality time in therapy I was a very aggressive child um, and I was um, not a particularly kind child and I had some things I had to work through. I didn't engage in gunplay, but I was very aggressive with kids, but people didn't see me because of both my outdoor outward, per I'm a young white girl, I'm the least likely to be watched. Um, and my play was somewhat innocuous. Let's play, um, let's play tea party. But the behaviors I was engaging in was really unhealthy. Okay, so, Literacy fundamentals within story play, kids are building their literacy fundamentals. So let's think about any play, cat family, um, pretend camping, superheroes. If we watch that with the standards in mind, we often see kids retelling with key details. We often see telling a narrative with a sequence of offense. We often see um, things that are much more sophisticated, right? dialogue and feelings don't show up till second grade, but kids are doing that in their play. They just haven't put it down on paper yet. They're writing stories in the air. But this is how kids come to understand symbolism. This is how kids come to understand metaphor. This is how kids come to understand senses of endings and feelings and reactions. Every time kids play, they engage in literacy fundamentals. The same way every time kids build, they engage in STEM fundamentals. It is so, interesting to watch kids at play with the standards for writing. Imagine it doesn't say anything about writing, but just kids play with, they're meeting like fourth grade standards in terms of their skill set. Eventually their motor skills are going to catch up. Eventually their letter sound is going to catch up, right? But I often capture their storytelling as a way to say, look at all you know about telling stories, right? Um, uh, Alicia, that's a great question. Um, uh, Alicia or Alicia, please correct me in the chat. Um, uh, and I'm going to pause on that till the end because that's like a big, I want to direct you to some places for that. So um, the last thing I'll say is social skills and executive function are, um, are um, tools of the mind, um, which kind of is all about building executive function, talks a lot about the ways in which fantasy play builds executive function. But just think about we're playing cat family, we disagree with something and now we have to work that out. Um, that is how society works, right? Um, that skill set. Now, um, just thinking about story play specifically, um, Imagine that I have this set up as an exploration with just the question, how do you play at the park? I grabbed three standards, right? Um, but thinking about how kids might interact with these materials with the question, how do you play at the park? What do we see about how we might be able to assess or deepen an understanding about identifying characters, settings, um, and major events in a story. How might we be able to deepen narrating a single event or several loosely linked events, tell about the events in the order in which they occurred and provide a reaction to what happened? How might we be able to deepen or provoke describing familiar people, places and events and with prompting and support provide additional detail, right? There's no worksheet in the world that is gonna cover all of these big ideas the way that open-ended story play can. All this involves are some little peg people um, some found materials, right? Um, and some time and space to play, right? And so um, capturing this can be tricky, 
Um, I know that you have that kids um, assessment that is sort of helping you think about how to do that. But oftentimes I would take little snippets of video. I would take observational notes. I would take, um, I would have post-its that I was trying to capture things on so that I could get a sense of what kids do when approached with this. It also helps me think about where we need to go in terms of creating a more equitable and just society. Who do they think is the male? Who do they think is the female? Who do they let engage in certain types of play? Who do they say can't play certain ways? What are the rules that they've, what are the rules of the world that they apply to essentially neutral and open-ended experiences? I use that to now find read alouds that I'm gonna put in this space. I use that to now provide scenarios and to study that I was gonna push against some of those questions, right? Um, I will say this is an older set, but you can now find sets that come in different wood tones, right? So that you don't just have the sameness across the board. These are unfinished for projects, but if you're gonna leave them like this, you can find them in different wood tones, which I think um, you can also have kids use these to make themselves and have those in the play spaces as well. But for the more neutral, like they can be anything, I would suggest finding them. Um, you can actually, it's a little bit easier to find them on Etsy that way. Um, not pre-painted, but just different wood tones. Um, but what, what do we see about how they use those materials? And then how do, I, um, how do I address and expand their understanding of the world and the rules that they operate under, which are not universal rules? Okay, so um, this is the last I'm gonna say about some of those play structures. This is just stuff for you to think about in terms of next, next year. Now, <clears throat> I'm reading a book about habits called Tiny Habits. And what's really interesting is it is, says that people often focus on aspirations and outcomes and not behaviors. But when you have an aspiration or an outcome, which is part of what I thought had you think about earlier, it's the behaviors that shift it. So let's say I wanna have, I wanna be less stressed. My aspiration is to be less stressed. I need to think about the behaviors that I'm going to do right now that lead me to that. And then I start with the one that feels easiest. So maybe you already have a center time. Maybe it's about trying to switch over one or two of those into an exploration, right? And that's gonna move you closer to your aspiration of more developmentally ap appropriate practice. Maybe my I'm looking to have a more shared space with less teacher. So I don't feel like it's about my classroom, that's about our classroom. So maybe the behavior I'm gonna shift is moving to a morning, to, is moving to that idea of a gathering. Maybe I'm not gonna change choice time yet, but maybe I am gonna have a gathering before choice time where kids help me problem solve things that are coming up, right? What's the behavior, the easiest behavior that takes you on the first step to your aspiration? So change is, um, Change doesn't have to be monumental on the first day. Change can be one small behavior that puts you on the path of your aspiration. So just for time, because I do want to leave space for questions. Um, instead of talking this out, I apologize. I'm just going to ask you to think about in the chat, just what's one thing you might take on? Is it moving to a gathering? Is it building in a reflection time? Is it seeing opportunities for story play? Is it reading one of the books? Right, but like what's one thing that you could do, right? A behavior that you can take on. As you're putting that in the chat or as you're reflecting on it, I just wanna say it's about the consistency of this. So whatever the thing is, I'm also gonna ask you to set yourself a little calendar reminder. So if you said, I'm gonna read Cultivating the Genius of Black Children, set a calendar reminder for tomorrow, now put it in a week and now put it in for 30 days from now, right? Um, if you said, I'm going to make sure that um, I have, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a look at getting more open-ended materials, remind yourself that tomorrow in seven days and 30 days and maybe right before school, right? So first I'm just gonna ask you to try and put it out in the chat, in the chat and then I'm gonna ask you to literally open up your phone and put it in as a reminder. The book Tiny Habits is really interesting. It's a quick read. So if you're thinking about um, just change in general and how we can help our school change, our district change, our, our colleagues change, um, 
I would say The Tiny Habits is a good book to start with. Um, it has like lots of little like do this activity, now do this activity, now do this, right? Um, and that might be a good a good place to start. Um, and then, uh, and maybe it's a semantics, maybe the goals stop saying play and work are different, right? Maybe that's a semantic shift you're gonna make, same basic thing. Um, as we um, leave this, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, you can keep using that chat to put some of those ideas in. I'm gonna strongly encourage you to use your, um, your calendar on your phone for this reason. Um, and then I'm gonna invite us as you do that to sort of shift to the idea to think about um, if there's any questions, anything you want more information on, anything I can direct you to. So I'm gonna start by talking about this Question, how do you allow for superhero or cowboys, et cetera, play without there being weapons or pretend violence? So Alicia or Alicia, um, and feel free to correct me in the chat. Um, personally, um, I don't put the limit on pretend violence. I put the limit on if someone says stop, you have to stop. So it has to be mutually agreed upon play. So if they want to play, um, if they want to play superheroes and they're going to be, you know, play fighting each other and whatever, um, you might have a no touch rule. Um, so well, you know, in movies and stuff, they're not actually touching each other; they're pretending, right? You can even show kids some clips of that, right? How like I move as you move, like it's it's all pretend. Um, but you might have a no touch rule. But I only had two rules, and one was say stop if you don't like something. Listen to stop if someone says it to you. I think that first rule is possibly the most important one: say stop if you don't like something, um, because. Uh, Sometimes I'll hear, oh, my child being bullied, my child being picked on or things like that. And my question isn't, I'm, I can't go around the world and protect your child from everyone. I can only teach your child how to self-advocate. And if they're not out there saying, stop, I don't like it, I need help, right? Then, then that's, that's a skill your we're working on with your child, right? How do they, now it's possible that, you know, your, the child is self-advocating and there's like a very specific type of problem that's happening. But one of the things I want kids to know is if you don't like something, if something's not fair, then you stand up for yourself and for others, right? We're upstanders in the words of, in the words of Sara Ahmed. So this idea of like, you can say stop, you should say stop um, is a really important one, I think. And too often we jump in to save kids when we want kids to first realize like you can save yourself, say stop, say no thank you, say I don't like that and then be specific. Um, having said that, if your community is gonna say no way, no day towards any kind of play violence, then it's really hard to play superheroes without that. But the key is to have a neutral tone about it. So not that you're a bad person because you want to play this way and not that it's bad play. It's just some things you can do at home and some things you can do at school. Like you can't, you know, um, you know, you can't eat potato chips on the couch and watch TV in school. Like that's not, but you, you know, so they, that idea that like, you just want to say it like neutrally in school, we do some things at home, we do other things. Any other questions or thoughts? I see lots of really interesting ideas coming up. Lots of great things folks are thinking about trying. Um, Cause soft transitions has come up a few times. What I'll just say is in my day, like moving from exploration to exploration, that's a soft transition. Um, whether or not you come to the rug for read aloud is a soft transition, but we all need to end at a certain time for lunch. Um, author of Tiny Habits is BJ Hogg, H-O-G-G. Other thoughts or questions that I can address? Remember, you can send them privately if you don't want to publicly announce a question you have or a wondering you have. Um, Francis Carlson is the person to read if you've got questions about kids playing aggressively at recess. So if you've got, um, and we uh, in the school, the last school I taught at, we made a huge shift to saying that you could you could wrestle and stuff at recess. Um, we were finding that not having that was having some implications. Um, and so we working with those two rules and doing some studies around um, 
Francis Carlson's work and some other people writing about it, we decided that we were going to stop. Um, Cause here's the thing. It was like, if you want to know um, how bias impacts schools, look at who sits out at recess. Look at who gets sent to the office. The problem isn't the kids, the problem is the way school is built. And so we, to address that bias we were seeing come up, we decided this was one of the changes we could in fact make, um, but we onboarded our, like our, you know, we didn't just like surprise, like we were really trying to be really thoughtful and intentional around it. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, so here's what I'll say to you, because I'm never one who's like, because to the final minute. Thank you so much for giving your time today. I know it's summer for some of you and it's just started and this year has been such a slog. And so the fact you showed it back up on Zoom, I so appreciate. Um, and I, I so um, honor you and your energy and I'm so thankful you are here.